For the first part of the first lecture of the semester, we're going to be covering core introductory concepts in probability theory. This is going to be absolutely essential material that you'll be coming back to and using throughout the semester, so you may need to review it many times. Each time you'll get a stronger understanding of it, and of course we'll come back to it at various points in the context of other problems, and you'll have an opportunity to strengthen your understanding of it throughout this class. We'll cover foundations of probability theory, joint, marginal, and conditional probability, Bayes' rule, and a simple worked example for human language we'll resort to throughout. We'll start off with probability spaces, which are traditionally defined in terms of sets. And you start off with a sample space, omega, and an event, for example, a die coming up in the number four or five, coin coming up heads, the next word that comes out of my mouth being the word angel. Any of these is an event in the sample space, and an event is simply a subset of the sample space. Now, a probability space on a sample space is a function from events in the sample space to numbers, to real numbers, that holds the following three axioms. First of all, non-negativity. Any event in the sample space has to have a probability greater than or equal to zero. The second is what we call disjoint union. If you have two disjoint events, that is, they can't both occur at the same time, their union is, uh, excuse me, their intersection is zero, is the empty set, um, then their union's probability, the probability of the union of E1 and E2, is equal to the sum of the probabilities of the individual events. That's disjoint union. And finally, properness, the probability of the sample space itself, which is the maximum event, it's anything at all happening, is 1. Now, these are set theoretic definitions, but we can also translate them into fundamental operations of Boolean logic. So, for example, the subset relationship between two sets is equivalent in Boolean logic to the implicational relationship. Disjointness, that is, that the intersection between two events is the empty set, is equivalent to saying that it's not the case that both of the events hold or can hold. And uh, union uh, is simply equivalent to disjunction. So we'll actually move throughout the course back and forth between these set theoretic characterizations and these logical characterizations. It turns out to be very convenient. And the simple example that we're going to be running throughout this part of today's lecture is very simple, but it's actually um, quite motivated in terms of the history of the English language. And this is also reflective of a phenomenon, word order variation, that occurs throughout the languages of the world. Historically, there was a time in English when noun phrases, so an NP, this is your first linguistics terminology of the semester, a noun phrase, which is, for example, the subject of a sentence often, the object of a sentence, all these are noun phrases, things like I, or the boy, or every girl in the room, or no one, these could appear as objects. And an object is something like, if I say I ate the apple, then the apple is the object. An object noun phrase, or NP, could occur either pre-verbally or post-verbally. In today's English, it's pretty much always post-verbal, as in I ate the apple, the apple is after the verb, he ate. But in historical English, there was a time when Object noun phrases could occur, occur either before the verb, that is pre-verbally, or after the verb, post-verbally. And we're going to represent this. This is your sort of first experience, perhaps, with this kind of little tree notation. We say that the verb phrase, which is the phrase, the collection of words, a sequence of words that includes both the object and the verb, could have this form where the object comes before the verb, or it come, this, the form where the object comes after the verb, as in illustrated here. Now, if you look at the language, if you look at the languages of the world, it turns out that there is a broad cross-linguistic tendency for objects that are pronouns, like me or her or them, to occur earlier in sentences on average than objects that are not pronouns, like the apple or anyone in the room or um, the hope for justice, all of these things are object noun phrases potentially, and none of those latter ones are pronouns. There's a broad cross-linguistic tendency for objects that are pronouns to occur earlier in average on, in sentences uh, than non-pronominal objects. So we can imagine a set of hypothetical probabilities. Oops. We can imagine a set of hypothetical probabilities over, um, over two things. One is whether the object occurs pre-verbally, that is before the, uh, before the verb, or post-verbally, that is after the verb. And then the second thing is whether the object itself is a pronoun or not. 
And what I've done here is I've devised a sort of hypothetical, this is not real data, but it reflects real patterns in language, a hypothetical contingency table, which is the probability of each of the four possible states of affairs with respect to these distinctions, pre-verbal rule versus post-verbal, pronoun versus not pronoun. And that contingency table, each of those entries is a probability and the sort of the most fine-grained events in this representation are the combination of whether the object is pre-verbal or not and whether the object is a pronoun or not. Now these two properties, x, the pre-verbal or post-verbal status of the object, and y, the pronominal or not pronominal status of the object, are sometimes what we'll call random variables in the language of probability theory. And what I've laid out for you here is what's called the joint distribution of those two random variables. Okay, And you'll notice that there's actually some interesting um, patterning of what those numbers are, um, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But terminologically, what I've introduced to you are two random variables that are grounded in a linguistically motivated property of sentences. And this contingency table, two by two set of probabilities, is the joint distribution over those two random variables. Now, we can take this example and we can check the axioms of probability. So here we'll take the sample space to be this complete selection of, um, of the set of four logically possible combinations of these two properties. So the sample space is that either the object is pre-verbal and a pronoun, pre-verbal and not a pronoun, post-verbal and a pronoun, post-verbal and not a pronoun. Any of those four logical possibilities. And now we can check, for example, so this allows us to say we could use the disjoint union property to tell us the probability of non-atomic events. So for example, let's define another event. We'll call it E1. This is just by fiat. We can just define events as we want. And it's this property of either the object is pre-verbal and a pronoun or the object is post-verbal and not a pronoun. Disjoint union says we can compute the probability of that event because these two individual things are clearly mutual contradictory to each other, we can compute the probability of that event as the sum of the two sub-event probabilities. In this case, 0.224 is the probability of the object being pre-verbal and a pronoun. It's in the upper left-hand corner of the contingency table. And 0.107 is the probability of the object being post-verbal and not a pronoun. It's the lower right number in the contingency table. So the sum of those two is 0 0.331. And According to these probabilities, disjoint union gives us this out, and we could apply this to any disjoint union of events. We can also check this contingency table for properness. That's simply the question of do the two, four probabilities sum to one, and indeed they do. You shouldn't be surprised. I constructed this example. It is a proper probability distribution. That's the axioms of probability. The next concept that I want to introduce you to, you to we looked at uh, joint probabilities and joint distributions. Sometimes we're interested in a joint distribution over multiple random variables, but actually we're, we want to actually simplify out and go to the distribution that's applied over only one of them. Without loss of generality, if we call the two variables x and y, then let's just say x. The definition here is that the marginal probability distribution, p of x, relates to the joint probability of p and x and y as follows. The, P, the probability P of X taking on, so we'll use a lot of the time, uppercase, random uppercase letters for a random variable and lowercase letters for a specific possible instantiation or a specific intended instantiation of that random variable. So lowercase x here is, you can say it's the particular value denoted by lowercase x, whereas capital X is the random variable. And we'll often use that distinction, but sometimes we'll alight it for simplicity. The marginal probability distribution of x is that the probability that capital X takes on the value of lowercase x is I take all the possible values of y, of the random variable capital Y, each of those values I'll denote with a lowercase y. So that's what this sums over the y's is. And I will sum together the joint probabilities of the particular value of x that I have in mind. So this x is, corresponds to that x with the summation over all of the values of the possible y's. Okay, and that's what's called the marginal probability distribution. In our particular case, suppose I was interested from this contingency table here in finding the marginal distribution on x, that is whether the object is pre-verbal or not. So for example, the, the probability that the object is pre-verbal is the marginal probability uh, 
that's a marginal probability, and so I have to sum over the possible values of y. Either the object is um, uh, a pronoun or not. I'm, I'm realizing that this is a mistake here. I will correct this afterwards, later on in the slides that I put up online. But that should be pronoun and not pronoun. Likewise, this should be pronoun and not pronoun. So the, um, this probability here is I'm going to sum up the probability of preverbal pronoun and preverbal not pronoun. So that's 0.224 from up here and 0.655 up here, and I'm going to get 0.879. And likewise, I do the same thing in the bottom row, and I get 0.121. And you find out once again, the sum of those two letter marginal probabilities are indeed um, is equal to 1 because of the proper distribution. Okay. Um, so we have this marginal distribution on X and this marginal distribution on Y. Now, the next concept that I want to introduce is the notion of conditional probability. Suppose that I have an event B and an event A. And I want to know what does knowing A do to my belief about whether B will hold. That corresponds to the definition, the notion of conditional probability. And definitionally here what we have is that the probability of B given A is equal to, by definition, the joint probability of A and B together divided by the marginal probability of A alone. So that's definitional. So to run another example, we go back to our contingency table. We have our joint probability table on the right, on the top. We have our two marginal probabilities below it. Suppose that I want to calculate the following property, the following quantity, which is the probability that y will that the rent, that the object will be a pronoun given that it is postverbal. At this point, actually, we're in a position to think about this from a real-time human language understanding perspective. This is an interesting property because it corresponds to the case where imagine that I'm I'm a listener and I'm listening to somebody speak to me in historical English. I might wind up in a state mid-sentence where, remember that historical English, in our characterization of it, has both preverbal and postverbal objects. And I might be in a situation where the object hasn't occurred yet, but I hit the verb. So for example, if I hear, I devoured, then I know devoured is the verb, but I haven't heard the object yet, but I know there will be an object. And now I might be in a position to make a prediction as a listener or an inference about how likely the object is to be a pronoun or not. And it's not going to just be necessarily the marginal probability, which is what I have here, because I have additional information. I know that the object is not preverbal, it is postverbal. And so I should actually be conditioning on the information that the object is postverbal. And that's what is encoded by that conditional probability of y being, being pronoun, x being postverbal. And I can, from the information that I have above, run this as a conditional probability calculation. By the definition of conditional probability, this conditional probability is equal to the joint of postverbal and pronoun divided by the marginal of postverbal. And in this case, I can get the joint up here, and I can get the marginal down here, and I divide the first by the second, and I get the result, which is 0.116. And you'll notice that that didn't occur, that 0.116 didn't occur anywhere in any of my probabilities so far because it is a conditional probability that you have to use the joint and the marginal to get together. Conditional probability calculation is an essential feature of um, both machine learning, statistics, and also it turns out a very powerful way of thinking about how the human mind works for language. And so we're going to be resorting to conditional probabilities all the time throughout this course. And it's always a useful thing to think about when I'm posing a scientific question or a question about what is an intelligent agent doing in a particular situation? What is the conditional probability that sort of best captures the problem that they're facing? So the next concept I want to introduce you to is the chain rule. And this is just another sort of massaging around of the definition of conditional probability um, to get something that turns out empirically to be very useful. I can rewrite a joint probability, like the joint probability of event one and event two, as the product of a marginal probability of event one times the conditional probability of event two and event one. You may remember that definitionally, the 
definition of conditional probability looked a lot like this, except E1 didn't appear in the numerator here, it occurred in the denominator over here. And so I get from the definition of conditional probability to this decomposition here just by multiplying both sides by P of E1. Okay. Now, I can actually generalize this to more than two variables, and you can do this at home to check. So this is the case of two variables. If I have three variables, I can decompose it to, for example, the probability of events one through three is probability of event three given the first two, the event two given the first one, and the marginal probability of event one by itself. And I can do this for any of an indefinite number of random variables. I can do chain rule de decomposition, and I can also do it in any order. So there's no intrinsic ordering of the events. And that is very important and useful, and we will make much use of it. It will play a prominent role in a number of kinds of models that we'll be looking at throughout the class. Um, so this generalizes to n events and so forth. Breaking a joint probability down into the product of a marginal probability and several joint probabilities this way is sometimes called chain rule decomposition. So you'll hear me at various points during the semester say, now we apply chain rule decomposition. Okay. The next thing, and this is the last new conceptual tool that I'll be discussing in this part of um, the lecture, is Bayes' rule, sometimes called Bayes' theorem. And it's a very simple idea, and it's mathematically trivial, but its power comes from its application. Bayes' rule conceptually is a way of recasting a conditional probability of one variable on the other in the opposite way. Sometimes for that reason it's called Bayesian inversion. And in fact, originally in the early days of the development of probability theory in Bayes' rule, Bayes' rule was sometimes called inverse probability for exactly this reason. It's swapping the conditionalization. So you notice that in this example here I have the probability of A given B and I'm rewriting it in a form where the only conditional probability is the reverse of B given A. That's the application of Bayes' rule. In order to do this, I have to invoke the marginals in order to get equality to actually hold. Um, this also holds, and in particular the marginals that I have to use, I have to multiply through the numerator of P of B given A by P of A and the denominator by P of B. And actually, if you run this in your head, you can find out pretty easily that this mathematically holds. It also holds with what we call sometimes extra background random variables. I'll call that I for simplicity here. And notice what's important here is that when you do that Bayesian inversion, when you swap the order of A and B with each other, so you notice here that what was the outcome, A, became the conditioning event, and what was the conditioning event, B, became the outcome. With extra background random variables, there are things that can stay on the conditioning side. So in this case, those I, the random variable, or you can think of it as a collection of random variables, I, stays on the right-hand side, on the conditioning side. Um, and so here, what I've done is I've applied Bayesian inversion to A and B. I stays on the right-hand side, and notice that it not only appears in the right-hand side here, but it also appears in the conditioning side of the marginals. Now, just to show you, if you haven't already run it in your head, how this theorem, extremely simple theorem, follows directly from the definition of conditional probability. Remember that, we, that the chain rule decomposition, which is effectively equivalent to specifying chain rule, um, uh, the definition of conditional probability, says that we can rewrite the joint of A and B as the conditional of B given A times the marginal of A. But importantly, we could have done that in the opposite order. We could have applied chain rule decomposition in the opposite order. I could have rewritten joint of A and B is equal to A given B times B. I notice that I'm stopping saying probability here. That's sometimes I will do that for convenience. And if you ever get confused, you can always ask me. So given that these two things hold, of course, we can set the two right-hand sides equal to each other. And then we simply divide both sides by the probability of B. And so then um, those two things cancel out, and we have Bayes' rule, which you can see that's equivalent to the equation that's on the top. Obviously, this doesn't hold if uh, the probability of B is equal to 0, because you can't divide by 0. Um, but this is actually um, going to be a case where this conditional probability is ill-defined. OK. One more close inspection of Bayes' rule, and this is getting to the point of how it's such a powerful thing. Oftentimes, the left-hand side of Bayes' rule, the conditional probability that we want to rewrite, we will call the posterior distribution. And to understand 
why we call it posterior, it's in relation to this other thing, which is what's called the prior. So suppose, and now I've gotten a given b, not b given a, so I've swapped the two variables around. Suppose that I'm interested in my belief about how likely event a is to hold. That's, if I have no other information, that's the marginal probability, p of a, that specifies that. We call that the prior probability because it's prior to additional information being incorporated. The additional information is the, is you can see manifest in the relationship between the equation or the, between the expressions for the prior and the posterior. So if I have additional information B, it changes my belief state about A, and now belief state I'm noticing I'm using the language of probability theory to describe it because that's what we're going to be using probability theory over and over again to do. Um, so the idea here is that we incorporate the notion, uh, we incorporate the additional information B, and that potentially modulates our belief or our probability that A will hold. And the revised value, the revised belief about A is this conditional probability of A given B. And we call that the posterior probability because it's posterior to learning information B. What's the relationship between the posterior and the prior probabilities? That is what Bayes' rule gives us. And notice that if you think of the prior as sort of the starting point, the way you get from the prior to posterior is you change the prior in two ways. First, you multiply it by what we call the likelihood, which is the other conditional probability, the conditional probability of B given A. And the likelihood basically says, if A is the case, how likely would that new information B have been to be observed? The second thing that we have to do is divide it by the marginal of B. That is sometimes what's called the normalizing constant. And that really just makes sure that the resulting probability distribution is proper. And the fact that you only need it for that purpose turns out to be useful and important in a lot of cases. So now I'm going to return to the example of preverbal, pronominal, postverbal, nonpronominal objects. And I'm going to use Bayes' rule to make, do the same computation that we looked at before but I'm going to take advantage of Bayes' rule to give you the same information that we had before in a different form that we couldn't have used so straightforwardly without Bayes' rule to compute the result, but we'll be able to use Bayes' rule to compute, and it'll be a good simple illustration of how to run Bayes' rule. So this is equivalent information, not in the same form, but it's actually equivalent information. First of all, I'm giving you a prior probability, the prior probability that an object is a pronoun. And then I'm giving you two conditional probabilities. The conditional probability of the object occurring preverbally given that it's a pronoun, and the conditional probability of it occurring postverbally given that it's a pronoun. These two conditional probabilities, of course, you can get the other two conditional probabilities, the probability of the object being postverbal given either of these conditioning cases, just by properness, subtracting one from one each of these values. Okay, so now I'm gonna put you in the state of mind again of the real-time human language understander. And the mechanism that I want you to think about is that underlying the computation of linguistic structure, linguistic prediction, linguistic meaning is always what's called incremental language processing or at the sentence level, incremental sentence processing. In real time, as you're listening to every word I say, your mind is doing extremely sophisticated computations to update your beliefs about, update your cognitive state belief about what is it that I mean, what is it that I'm likely to say next, and so forth. And by hypothesis, if that's what's going on in your mind all the time, you will be always updating, not consciously most of the time, but you'll always be updating your implicit belief state about what I'm likely to say next. And so let's go back to that situation where mid-sentence, I just said, an ob uh, just said a verb, I just spoke a verb, like devoured, that makes it clear that an object is coming up, but I haven't actually spoken the object yet. So if you were, in your mind, using Bayesian inference to always update the probability of the object being pronominal, then I might modulate it at that at this point because there's new information that I got, that the object is postverbal. Now notice that what I've specified here is a sort of natural ordering of the random variables from the speaker's point of view. We can imagine that maybe when the speaker organizes their 
their sentence in their minds, maybe they first make a decision about whether to refer to something using a pronoun or not, and only subsequently decide the word order. Now, it's an open question scientifically whether that's actually what we do, but it's plausible to at least entertain that possibility. It's just a plausible a priori architectural setup for how language, some aspects of language production would work. Now, that's the speaker's point of view, but notice that these probabilities do not hand to you on the platter, on a platter, the conditional probability that is maybe most relevant from the comprehender's point of view, from the listener's point of view. That is, given that an object is, is a, that an object is postverbal, how likely is it to be a pronoun? That is not directly encoded in these things, but you can compute it from these quantities. How do we do that? Well, let's see how we do it with base rule. So here is the conditional probability in question that I'm interested in. The probability that the object is a pronoun, given that it's postverbal. Bayes' rule tells me that I invert this probability into um, a form that has the conditionalization the other way around by saying that the probability of y given x is equal to the probability of x given y times the prior probability of y divided by the normalizing constant, which is the prior probability or the marginal probability of x. Okay. Now, we've actually made some progress here because whereas before this thing didn't correspond to any of the three quantities that I had up here, now you can see that the conditional probability that I've got here actually does correspond to something that I've got in my little table of knowledge. Okay? And that's part of the beauty of Bayesian inversion is it can transform a conditional probability query into a form that I have explicitly represented in sort of some knowledge bank. Okay. And that's actually a fundamental operation in the application of Bayes' rule in the context of AI research. And that's been true for decades and it's true today. Um, however, I'm still stuck with, uh, so I, oh, I should also say that I also get, whoops, going back one. I also have this other thing. This prior probability is also something that I now have. So I'm actually in pretty good shape, but you'll notice that there's one thing I don't have yet, which is this marginal probability, the normalizing constant. And that's actually should be no surprise to you. So in the application of Bayes' rule, computing the normalizing constant is often the very most complicated thing to do. Okay. How do we do it? We have to resort back to the fact that, first of all, the normalizing constant is a marginal probability. And we reviewed the definition of how a marginal probability works and how to compute it. You have to go back to the joint probability and explicitly marginalize out all the possible values of the variable that you don't care about. So I've gotten to that joint probability here, and I would marginalize out all the possible values of y, that is whether or not the object is a pronoun, but you'll notice that I actually don't, still don't have that, marginal prob or that joint probability here. Instead, I need to do one more step, which is I have to now rewrite the joint probability with the chain rule decomposition. I have to use the chain rule decomposition to re-express the joint of x and y as the conditional of x given y times a marginal of x. And notice now I've got this into a form where I have all of the individual components here. Okay. And so just to express this fully explicitly, there are two possible values of y, either pronoun or not pronoun. I write them explicitly out here. I do the math and I turn my arithmetic crank and I get an answer, 0.116. And this, and you can check your, this work afterwards, is actually, if you remember, it's exactly the same number that we got early on when we were just posing, we we're representing our knowledge in a different way with the joint probability table and the two marginals and it's directly using the definition of conditional probability. And the point here is that actually it's arguably a more concise representation of the complete information state that we had with the joint probability and the two marginals to use this format that we have up here as a, pro, as a marginal and then a couple of conditionals, um, it's arguably a simpler representation. And when you get bigger and more complex sets of random variables with more values, it becomes a vastly more simple representation. And we can actually still go back and get all of the conditional probabilities we want by applying Bayes' rule in the right ways. And um, th fortunately, we're not going to get into it today, but there's automated machinery to do a lot of that. But the conceptual work here of taking one conditional probability distribution and recasting it in terms of another is a really important lesson that we're going to see over and over again during the class.
So um, just to, uh, to end with a little bit more information, sometimes you'll see Bayes' rule written, this is what we looked at here on the top, in a different way. And the part, this, under, this arises from the fact that, um, as you saw before, the hardest part of using Bayes' rule in that case was calculating the normalizing constant. Sometimes you'll hear the normalizing constant referred to as the partition function. As in this example, it's very often that this is the hardest thing to do in Bayes' rule. And sometimes you don't need to do it. Sometimes, first of all, well, sometimes you emphasize the explicit marginalization. And you don't say just marginal probability of B. You say sum over all the possible values of A, joint of A given B. So explicitly writing the marginalization out of the variable whose um, prior and posterior you're, you're interested in. The second option is to simply ignore the partition function and to note that even without the partition function, I can express the conditional probability of A given B in terms of the prior on A and the likelihood of B given A up to proportionality. 